So I'm pleased to have as part two, uh, Brad and Jason back again, Brad Rowland and Jason Sosa uh, talking about the future work. And offline, we were just having some discussion that we think is relevant for uh, discussion for where we're going. So um, if we want to pick up on where we were, we were talking about the manufacturing environment. And I was giving an example that this conversation has taken place in the past with uh, um the changes with the internet and uh, companies with globalization and my little economy back in Michigan, we had a manufacturing company that uh, was 2,500 people in the company itself and uh, around the company were a supply chain. Somebody in Sweden made the decision that uh, that company no longer was going to be in Michigan, it was going to be in Mexico. And so that disruption took place, but we seem to be coming back around to, to these discussions again. Yeah, in the 90s, I mean, uh, the, these new technologies made it possible to start businesses in ways that you never could before. And it was kind of a rarity. It was just the emerging of that time. But now we're kind of seeing it as a, out of a necessity. So it, it, we, we've, uh, we've, we've kind of pulled away from the, the um, well, I guess the, the automation sector and, and the, the manufacturing sector and all of these this disruptions that are happening um, have, have created a, a greater awareness that there's a need to take care of those people. And what do we do with that? Do we provide universal basic income? Is there some other um, you know, mechanism that we can cr- create that would allow them to survive? Um, so I think entrepreneurship is becoming more and more um, uh, of an awareness between people b- because there really is no other option. So there is the sharing economy with Ubers and those kinds of things, which is really a capital extraction model. You have a bunch of people that are um, you know, going out in their vehicles uh, because it's, it's a, they need the income. Um, but then you have other people that are, are seeing the need to uh, provide expertise in whatever they can do. Whether it's through YouTube, Instagram, uh, Upwork. I mean, there's, work is an app away now in a, in a, in a way that it hadn't been in the past. Um, where you're not necessarily uh, dependent on a manufacturing um, employer uh, like in the way you used to be. Yeah, and Phil, you were mentioning, you know, uh, in Michigan, a situation where a, a refrigerator factory was moved, and now you have all these employees that have this expertise. Why didn't they just start their own company? Right. Right, because mm-hmm. you have all the expertise to actually run the company there, and you somehow move the company, there. and everyone is displaced. And, and I think a lot of it's just because we've trained people to be employees, Right. Instead of think entrepreneurially, entrepreneurially, um, and we, you know, we talk a lot of uh, about Henry Ford and a lot of positive stuff about industrial automation, manufacturing line automation. But a lot of that was to take the power away from the workers, right, and give them a very specific thing that they were good at. Um, so how hard is it when they get displaced from that type of job to teach them the rest of the skill set to go start that as a business? And, right. you know, I, that's a lot of what we've been trying to do here, right? You get all the expertise in the same room and people realize they are smart enough to go turn their skill set into, you know, into their own venture um, and not be dependent on someone else's business. How much of a risk do you guys see um – and uh, this is not politics, it's just simply dealing with uh, the realities of uh, the situation at this point. But people did have a, a mentality that was dependent on the man, if you will. The, I'm going to go to work for this company and I'm going to retire there and that's where I was at. But I do see a shift um, uh, kind of uh, at this point to the government being the man. And uh, the government is going to supply me a universal basic income uh, or... Uh, somehow that's going to happen and my skill level is going to go down. And there's a risk of, of course, with COVID uh, coming on that people truly were displaced because of that and people can't starve. So the government uh, having displaced people with shutdowns uh, steps up to the plate. But you almost change again uh, a mentality of our society that we're going to be reliant upon somebody else. And that just doesn't feel like the future to me. The future to me feels like it's our own bootstrap. We're having a boot camp uh, kind of uh uh, effort here in um, where we live um, in Fremont County, Colorado. Um, do we become dependent? Is the future about independence or is the future about dependence as far as moving to forward? The challenge is that there's a huge portion of the population that don't have boots, much less bootstraps. So there's not much to pull up from. So there, there, there is, a, um, I think, a bigger concern of, of civil unrest. What do we do when a large portion of the population can no longer afford to eat, uh, have housing, um, we're seeing. I just I just saw a video today of in Washington and, and by the capital, uh, Washington State, huge uh, uh, you know ten cities, and you're seeing this in Oakland, you're seeing this in, in Grand Rapids, where I'm from. So we see these uh, happen all over the place, and I think there's probably a greater awareness, probably more so for people in the cities, because they're seeing the direct effects of it, probably more so than those in the rural communities, that we are all connected. 
that my neighbor suffering directly impacts me. So uh, there's probably a greater realization of that, not necessarily as a dependency, but more so as a social responsibility that we are the richest country on earth at the greatest time of prosperity in the history of mankind. How do we find ways to better um, enable those that are disadvantaged and not necessarily by their own fault? Um, I mean, when you look at some of the displacement and employment, when you look at some of the historical inequalities that have happened, um, I think that there are many people that are trying to figure out what do we do here because uh, there are largely there's, there's, these, there's these large groups of people that are largely abandoned, um, not only in, in uh, economic means, but also in, in the mindset. You're here only for a handout. Uh, you're here to, to, to do it yourself. Don't you understand? I went to Harvard. Can't you do the same? So I think there's a few people that are um, trying to find a, a way to avoid the civil unrest that would most likely be inevitable if we don't do something uh, to provide their means. And it could also enable them to have an entrepreneurial experience. If you're not necessarily directly worried about your, uh, your meal, uh, how to keep your house warm, um, you know, the basics of life, you have a, an opportunity to take a chance. And I think that's one of the advantages and privileges that I had because my father was entrepreneurial. He taught me those things. And I had an opportunity to go do things because, uh, because of that. You know? So not everyone has that opportunity, but I think if, if, if there are – and of course there will be some, a portion, that will rely uh, in, a, in a negative way right, uh, on the system. But there's also another portion that could be lifted out and find upward mobility to uh, create value for other people. So a lot of the people that we've seen moving out to a rural area are people that – you know, by a, a world, at least by any other standard, look very successful, uh, but they're missing something in their lives. And when they move down and they get settled in, one of the very first things they do is look for opportunities to connect. Where can they volunteer? Where they want to be part of a, of a community, right? Uh, because it's amazing that, you know, we have these large homeless populations that are someone's family, someone's brother, sister, mom, dad, kid, right? How did we ever let that happen where those people got disconnected, from, you know, that we see them as some other group of people not part of our larger extended family? So it's a holistic, uh, when you talk about the future work and the disruption that likely is going to take place, it is not isolated to that topic. It is something that uh, impacts all of us. And, you know, the work is about uh, providing a product or a service for the rest of the community. Well, there's got to be people who have the economic means to actually take advantage of that product or service. And it seems that uh, community is more important in the future than it's ever been. And in a small town, rural area, um, which many of us uh, have participated in, that community, that connection, if you will, seems uh, easier to get. Um, but again, what happens with global, uh, the global impact, uh, et cetera. So. Yeah. So a big part of our economy right now is you know, probably thanks to Edward Bernays, right, um, earlier in the century. So you're always one purchase away from emotional or psychological fulfillment. You're always mm -hmm. your next purchase away to drive the capitalist, the, you know, the acquisition economy. So how do you shift that without big economic disruption? I'm not sure. But um, again, over the last year, when people haven't been able to afford a lot of those things and realize that really wasn't what made them happy uh, to begin with, how do we maybe make that shift without uh, injuring a lot of people, you know, a lot of people in the process? Um, our internship programs, I think one of the, when we were talking earlier about out of necessity, we couldn't have 100 students in a big classroom with 100 computers. We had one entrepreneur with one intern. Well, that sounds like apprenticeships from 100, 200 years ago. Mm -hmm. And when you see kids working like that with an, a generation or two older than them with the, passing down those skill sets, you see why it's really valuable. It's not just learning the skill. It's learning the skill with integrity. How does it fit in socially and culturally? How does it contribute to a larger whole? Why does why did that entrepreneur choose this as their passion project? Like we you know, we always go to Luke with River Science or uh, Alex with Three Rocks Engineering or or Lester with um, P three communities as an architect. You know, he believes that his architectural background is what enables him to help other people get achieve their life goals because mm -hmm. so many other businesses are dependent on the space so not just sending a kid to coding camp or architectural cad camp but working with an architect who's who's passionate about that because how it helps uh, build other people how did we ever get away from that right mm -hmm. how did we ever decide that that wasn't a good thing to you know to teach people a skill set in the context of a uh, culture and a society and a and, you know, a larger family. And the greatest untapped 
potential is, is, is this human resource of individuals that um, have largely been forgotten or, or dismissed. So it, there's this whole capitalistic model that you described, which is you know, being secure about yourself, about your skin, about your car, about whatever, that will fulfill you, that will make you somehow complete and whole, has been sold for since the days of Mad Men and Madison, uh, Madison Avenue. So that's, I think there's um, uh, probably in the future, ideally, what we would like to see is probably a greater emphasis on intrinsic motivation. The, the thing that wakes you up every morning, the thing that gets you out of bed is uh, the value you can provide and, and the community that you can connect. And that's, uh, there's a reward greater in, uh, than the, um, the beanbag or the pool table or the, the ping pong table in an office or whatever luxury that they can lure you with. But there is a greater sense of meaning and purpose. We talked about the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? It's more than just the basic needs providing for my survival. There's actually a, a desire, I think, in a new generation to find self-actualization. So somebody is listening to this right now and uh, they are identifying with uh, the concepts that you guys are talking about, the self-actualization. I've got a product idea. I've got a service idea. Can we dive in just for a few moments and talk about what does it take to start a business? Um, how is it that uh, in the 21st century we need to, or what steps we can uh, give uh, on this audio uh, recording of the best thing to do with your product, your service idea to actually conceive and start something? What's the first step? First thing I can think of is make mistakes as young as you possibly can when the risk is low and the cost is low. As soon as you get older, you get responsibilities, you have bills, you have mortgages, you have kids, you have all of these other things that will definitely make it more challenging. So we're, we've, we've taken kids out of that realm of risk taking. We give them big red marks on their papers and we tell them that's bad and they should be seeking perfection. And so it's, it is really you know from the very early days of, of a training of a mindset, a mental model, that failure is bad, when in fact, it's the best feedback mechanism we can get from the real world. So in the very early days, as soon as you can, do your lemonade stand, sell your brownies and, and cookies door to door, um, not in a pandemic. You know, I mean, find, find something what you can do, especially in, in today's modern world. I even tell my kids, you know, your Facebook marketplace, find something that somebody has that you can buy and that somebody else needs and then sell it. Or buy it on consignment and get a percentage. Or uh, there are lots and lots of ways to make money now, but I think it requires a degree of creativity and risk taking. So that resiliency muscle has to be built from a very early age. I think that's true. Um, I am familiar with some of the, uh, the statistics that uh, most entrepreneurs uh, start a business and they fail 3.8 times before they're successful. So you're talking about getting those, some of those failures. But I also am aware that uh, a lot of 45 year olds have been disrupted from the job and they're having a hard time because of ageism or whatever it is that uh, somebody has given them those and they decide they're going to start their own business. And uh, if that's the case, and many of them very successful that they've started something later in life, uh, so-called, uh, that uh, proves to be successful. So again, how do you take a, a conception? Somebody is listening right now. They've got a business idea. What's the first step that they need to take uh, to start that business? So I would say plug into an entrepreneurial community, uh, find meetups where you can meet other successful entrepreneurs. And um, as soon as you are really solid about your business idea, outsource every piece that you don't need to do yourself. You know, find a good bookkeeper to do your books. Find some good marketing people to help you with marketing. Focus on that one thing. And that one thing really needs to be something that adds real value. Um, We've probably all heard the story about the tech entrepreneur that invented website pop-ups, made a lot of money on that, then invented a product to block website pop-ups, <laughs> then invented a product to get around blocking website pop-ups, right? So if you invent a problem and then solve it, you're not really adding a lot of value. Um, what's kept me passionate about doing 25 years of tech marketing is only working for companies or startups or building companies that I thought were really adding adding value. You know, a tech product that helps doctors be more productive and focus time on their patients, for instance, right? Um, a product that helps uh, foster care facility do all of their tracking so they can focus on taking care of kids and putting them back into families. Something that really does contribute value. Um, but as far as first steps, it's easy to learn from someone else who's a couple steps ahead of you. They don't even need to be really far ahead of you. If they're one step ahead of you, they have something that they can teach you. Yeah. And I've uh, often um, talked about the example of playing on what you're talking about, Brad, is um, there's a difference between an independent contractor and an entrepreneur. And um, I think where a lot of people in those initial steps make a, a, 
a challenge for themselves is they become the business, if you will. They don't build it outside of themselves, uh, which is if uh, you're going to sell your car, uh, your car is outside of yourself and you turn it over and give somebody the keys, they can put the keys in and run it. The same thing is true with a business that um, if you're creating it outside of yourself and creating the value, the system, the product, uh, everything, so that it is something you can turn the keys over to someone else and they can run that business and that is creating some wealth. Uh, it employs other people, and you talked about, again, a distributed kind of thing that focus on that specific thing. So a, a business um, is not a professional service where I'm a, a chiropractor and I'm delivering that service and I can't sell it because I am the chiropractor. If you're creating a business outside of yourself, it's that system component that, it, that takes place. So there's uh, legal issues that you have to take in, involved. Uh, you have to file an LLC, perhaps with the state you're involved with. Uh, you have to put in a business plan. I'm just wondering what a good business plan looks like uh, from a marketing perspective, uh, the capitalization issues. How do you deal with those things to have enough money to actually start a business? The hardest part I've, I've found for many people is they're just scratching their head on where do I get started? I mean, there, there's just too many ideas. There's an abundance of, of opportunity, I think. And, and it's like you were talking about, there's a need to systematize some of these things. There's been so much disruption that has happened because of COVID, because of uh, financial markets, because of all kinds of things. And what we're seeing now is an opportunity um, in the, at the intersection of some of these trends to add value, either as a, but more, normally it's going to have to focus on a niche. So I think probably the most important thing is to define your, define your problem, define yeah. who the customer is. Um, that is usually the most difficult thing. And then that is a validation process. So the LLC and some of those other mechanics, I think are, um, those things can be, can be learned. I think the more difficult thing is, is, is how to, um, how to, how to discern the, the problem um, and to to extract that information from the customer in the real world. So we're, we're kind of, uh, I think, definitely in the education system to sit down, write a business plan, and then you execute to that business plan. When in reality, what you're doing is you're iterating multiple times and you're failing um, upward, right? You're failing toward success. So you, you, you make changes, you make pivots. I think it's that level of resiliency that's needed, which is very difficult for some people to stomach. So uh, that's probably one of the more important parts is the, the customer validation process of finding the product market fit, finding the, the, the customer segment and your value proposition and that those two things connect. And then the, the more, I think really important is also to not scale too quickly. Um, some people will get lots of, of, of funding for things really quickly in a startup and then that can cause other problems. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a mantra I call it, just nail it, scale it, otherwise you fail it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you guys were talking about uh, writing out a business plan. So, like, the first rule of business plans is they're always wrong. Right? Exactly. <laughs> uh, so don't spend a year trying to get the perfect business plan because right. you can't business plan your way to success. You can't whiteboard your way to success. The business plan is a conceptual framework. You put it together, you get out, and you start testing against it, and you see where all your data was wrong, and then you start to plug in new data, and you use that business plan as a guide to move you to the next step. Fail fast is great. Uh, because we are so afraid of failure, right? You got to have the perfect, perfect thing. You're never going to have the perfect thing. I think every business, the most successful businesses that I've been in, I wouldn't say they've pivoted, uh, but they have never been successful with their first product or their first channel program, Absolutely. their first marketing, their first sales program. It changes, uh, and you have to be. Um, able to be dynamic. Um, you also have to give it the amount of time that it takes when you test an idea. So if you put a cake in the oven for 10 minutes instead of 40, you're not going to get cake. So, right. So wisdom, same ingredients, but no cake, same ingredients. So, you know, learning from other entrepreneurs, those are ones who have gone, they might not have tested what you're testing, but they can tell you that's a good idea to try for six months. If it hasn't worked in that time frame, you're probably doing, doing something wrong, right? Doing exactly what other people have done gets you maybe a successful but mediocre business. If you want to be wildly successful, you're typically going where people haven't haven't gone before. So right. you learn the concepts, but the execution or the application is going to be different every time. And that's why being an entrepreneur is so fun. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. Yeah, it used to be the scarlet letter was uh, a for adulterer, and uh, I just want to tell people that. Uh, Failure is uh, not a scarlet letter with an F on you, and uh, it's something that uh, allows you to, to go forward. So, gentlemen, if I'm uh, a good cook, um, am I going to be successful as a restaurant? So I can make this fabulous uh, spaghetti, and uh, as a result, I want to start a restaurant. So I'm guaranteed success because I can make spaghetti better than anybody else, right? 
Well, uh, there's spaghetti and there's people management. I think that's probably the biggest <laughs> action. That's actually quite close to spaghetti. So, I mean, there's uh, there are so many aspects of building a business. And usually the skills required to build something isn't usually what's needed to, to maintain or manage or scale. Um, and so it, it's what Brad was saying earlier. It's it's uh, it's finding your your specialized sauce for you and then surrounding yourself with others that can complement uh, in areas of weakness because we just can't be good at everything mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and there's a actually there's an analogy in the book on the e-myth or the entrepreneur myth where they they, they dive exactly into this and uh, usually what happens in those situations is you end up hating cooking spaghetti mm-hmm. so there there is a need to really love what you do because that carries you through the the turbulence of some of the challenges um, but you, you really need to find something that's going to be a, an extension outside of yourself. I think if you're looking for a sustainable business rather than one where you own your job, I mean, that's certainly one avenue um, as a lifestyle business. But I think that uh, if you're looking at a business that is um, something that's more sustainable for the long term, it, it really should be systemized outside of yourself. So we're talking about future work uh, and failure is not something that we um highlight and say it's great it's the learning from failure that is the good part and you talked about the e-myth book that is out there and i know there's a couple revisions of that uh, as well how important do you see learning as part of being successful in a business oh my god always learning absolutely uh even your restaurant example here rural right so we've had people come down from a larger metro area to set up a new restaurant and they're dealing with problems that they've never dealt with before like uh in a in a metro environment everyone has worked as a wait staff before. Everybody's had a restaurant job, right? Mm -hmm. You come and start a new restaurant in a community. You're hiring and training people who have never worked in a restaurant before, right? And some of the things that we take for granted, um, you know, we're trying to set up a lunch tomorrow with a particular restaurant in town. Their uh, heat went out because we just had this minus 15 cold snap, right? So we've got a restaurant manager dealing with things that you would just take for granted somewhere else. So if you don't have that ability to stop and deal with these problems while working on your bigger thing, now maybe they didn't think by uh, opening a restaurant down here they were going to learn about HVAC and employee, you know, basic employee training. Uh, but that's what it took to get that business to be successful, you know, surprisingly in this space. Right. Um, one of the things I used to encourage my teams to do in the Bay Area pretty regularly was, you know, outside interests. So many of their business ideas for our core business came from their other outside interests or while they were doing something else, right? Because if you're, if you're focused on the same thing all day, that's pretty much what you're going to, what you're going to see. Um, so how do we pull that always learning environment in, into the workplace? Because I think it's what, uh, makes people think about problems differently, come up with new ideas, you know. Yeah. Yeah, there was this idea in the past that you learned and you got your degree and then, then you're done. Um, I think that that is going away, as it has gone away. Learning, lifelong learning is, is definitely um, a critical step in success. Paid or unpaid. Paid or unpaid, yeah. It, it is, it is a, it's just par for the course. And um, as, we, as we begin to learn new things, we, we see new opportunities, we, we expand ourselves as human beings. So I've always had this belief that whenever you're building something, it's not about the goal of what you accomplish or achieve, it's who you become through the process. So you're really investing in yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, you get to learn the HVAC system or the, or even the supply chain uh, disruptions that we've had for restaurants. You know, there's a million different things that will come up and then you'll be able to add that to your arsenal of, uh, of, of problems that you can solve. Are entrepreneurs born or made? Is there certain characteristics you're born with, and so now you're going to be a successful entrepreneur? And then we're not talking about Elon Musk here. We're talking about the average person, so whatever he was. Um, and I admire him, so I'll just be clear about that. But, uh, again, is there something that I'm going to start a business, but I'm just not uh, – I wasn't born that way? Or is it something I can learn it, and it's something that uh, I can learn these skills, these abilities, and I can be successful at my business? So what I love about listening to Elon Musk, like his long uh, format TED Talk, it's about the questions that he asks. Mm-hmm. Um, he's certainly a very brilliant guy. He can sit down and learn a new topic that um, would take years for many of us. And he can learn very quickly. But the kinds of questions and just questioning, why has it always been like that? Why can't we do that? Uh, you know, why, okay, if we want to get from one side of Los Angeles to the other faster, we need to make a higher um, you know, higher overpass, but why haven't we looked at going underground? You know, why? Uh, well, it's too expensive. Why? Just keep asking the question, why? You know, mm-hmm. I think most successful entrepreneurs see a problem that people have just always accepted. 
uh, they're typically problems that have been around for a long time and nobody just asked, well, why, why is it like that? Maybe there's a technology breakthrough it's waiting for, but often it's just something that we've come to accept. Um, so I just love listening to him because you, you get out, you know, listen to one of his 30 minute talks and think, well, yeah, you know, why, why didn't we develop reusable rockets or why haven't we been doing tunnels under, why not? Mm -hmm. You know, we just assume that's the way it's, it's always been. So mm -hmm. And then, of course, he builds really, really, really good teams around him of really smart people and lets them go do their do their thing. Right. So, and it allows rockets to blow up. And uh, the point of that is persistence. That uh, we're not giving up. And Edison, who is from Michigan, um, you know, they talk about uh, the old thing that is accurate. That uh, it took two thousand attempts to actually come up with the light bulb. And he could have stopped at 1950, and we wouldn't have, uh, at least he wouldn't have been the inventor of the light bulb. So how important is persistence uh, in this learning environment of something we call entrepreneurship? Yeah, so go going back to your earlier question on is uh, entrepreneurship something you're born with or you can learn from? I think there are certain aspects of entrepreneurship that can be taught. But as a society, we tend to value charismatic boldness. Um, there are certain temperaments and personality traits that some will have greater advantages than others simply by being born. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way things are. Not to say that you can't. Um, I, I've always, I struggled through stuttering. I, stu I struggled through social anxieties before I was able to even speak in public. I think I'd do 100 speeches before I could do it a, you know, on, on stage. So there, there are things you can overcome, but there has to be this in internal resiliency to get through those things. And that, that is... Um, it is both. I really do think it is both. So you can have a, um, a temperament that perhaps is a bit more meek, that is a bit more uh, focused on engineering or the, the detail aspects of things. And you would be a fantastic technical co-founder, the Steve Wozniak, to summon Steve Jobs. So th there are places for people in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, even if you're not as charismatic as the Elon Musks of the world. So there's Facebook, uh, there's uh, Twitter, there's Elon's uh, businesses that he's had. Is every bit of entrepreneurship already ate up by these guys? Or do you see a wide spectrum of the future where we can all have our little niches? There will be entrepreneurs as long as there are problems. So, And there are plenty of problems. So I, I, In the world. And that can be not only the world, but it can be your world. And uh, that can be as micro as you want it to be. In this pandemic, what we're probably seeing is a lot of people um, are, are realizing that they have some specialized knowledge, whether they've gone through um, an eating disorder, they've gone through some kind of you know, uh, emotional challenge, or they have a specific expertise in how to do something. And then from that, they realize I can go on, on YouTube and I can just talk. And they've built up a community. And you don't necessarily need to have a million people following you. You can just have, like uh, Steve Blank describes it as uh, 1,000, or is it um, Kevin Kelly, uh, 1,000 true fans. And then out of 1,000 true fans, you can generate enough money to live. Mm -hmm. So there are plenty of problems in the world that, that uh, can be uh, addressed. But it, it does take that courage to take that first step and to stay in line. Like you were saying, it's, it's the time frame. You can't just bake the cake for 10 minutes and say, oh, I guess it didn't work. You know, there is a, a compounding effect on time. Um, that, that, that takes place. Any other thoughts, gentlemen, on this particular topic of entrepreneurship? No, I just want to thank Jason. Seems like only yesterday that we were recording uh, session one. Thanks for coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Great to be here again. And, uh, Flown all the way from time. Michigan yeah. just to be here again. So. Yeah, I guess just for a little bit of context. So we're sitting in my office at Emergent Campus, which is um, uh, probably an 80,000 square foot, 100 year old historic high school building in uh, Florence, which is pro probably a population of about 3,000 at the time of this recording. We're probably about an hour from Colorado Springs. Jason flew in from uh, Michigan to hang out for a little bit and enjoy some Fremont County hospitality. And um, in this building, we've got co-working, small offices, and large offices. Uh, we have people who have brought their skills with them to be location-neutral workers, people who are starting small businesses, uh, people who have had very successful large businesses that want to downsize and or add their skill set to help other people. Phil, you've been one of those people. Um, especially with, you know, I, I have a ton of business experience and you're one of the first people that I'll call uh, when we're looking at a new venture or trying to help out somebody who's doing, um, who's doing a new business here. So that's the context of where we're sitting. Uh, last night we had delicious uh, Italian food. Hopefully if the um, 
uh, situation improves, we'll have world-class Indian before Jason uh, goes back to Michigan. But I just wanted to thank you for coming down and, and uh, doing this in person. So we've been wanting to do this for a long time. And thank you, Phil, for setting it up. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And uh, we do want to talk to our about our producer, who is uh, Sage Goodwin. And uh, Sage, uh, Brad, can you remind me what he's got the number one podcast for in the, in the Star world? Star Wars Battlefront online game uh online gaming so sage is a uh, let's see he's 22 year old he's our poster child for the gen z gig economy guy so he lives rural uh, not because he has to but because he loves it and uh, he grew up in a family where they spent a lot of time driving around the country in an rv and working on farms and doing all kinds of stuff he's super technical uh, he's my right hand man on some marketing projects we have some business ventures together and he loves helping local businesses get their get their voice, uh, establish their identity. Uh, when you have successful small rural businesses, people have overcome a ton of things. By the time you see a storefront that's been in place for more than a couple of months, there's a backstory behind that about overcoming, overcoming, overcoming. And Sage loves helping those companies. Uh, you know, it's, it sounds very tactical, their logo or working on their website or doing a podcast, but it's really helping them. Uh, get their true brand identity out. Why are they passionate about what they do? Um, so he's, I love being in the same office with him. Very inspiring. And he's managing our podcast recording today. Thank and you. We do appreciate it, Sage. Thank you. And I do have one last question uh, for you guys. And it's actually one I think that is uh, pretty close to a couple of years' hearts. Uh, I'm aware of it. So people have been going through COVID and there's been entrepreneurs and it's been hellish. Uh, there are people that uh, have, um, lost their business. Uh, there are people that uh, we are aware of that have taken their own life as a result of this. And um, just with the, the tremendous stress, what would you tell people that are going through uh, something uh, feels like they're in a dark place and how do they get out of it? Is there hope for the future because of all this stuff that's been coming at me that I really didn't cause? This is all external to them and it's coming at them. And um, we certainly don't want them to make a decision that they would regret and their family members and their friends and everyone else. Um, you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, and I'll go first so we can close with Jason and because he's got the most intelligent voice. Uh, we'll end with something smart, <laughs> smarter than what I'm going to say. But uh, we had a, a, a big opportunity this year, let me back up a little bit, to, to launch a new program. And it was a program focused on creating new entrepreneurs, right? New businesses, baby baby businesses, new entrepreneurs. And because of COVID, it, it was a really unique kind of opportunity that has not come up before. Uh, but because of COVID, we took a step back and said, is it really right to push people into starting a new business right now in this climate? Is it maybe better to train them? They can help. They can work alongside of another successful business. And as things improve, uh, because in, in this environment, uh, rural businesses might have taken all of their money out of, you know, from under their mattress or uh, in a shoebox in their closet, right? And they have everything on the line with this business. It's not like uh, Silicon Valley where, you know, the, the best way to get a $100 million investment is to lose a $10 million investment. Like the more you lose, the more people will come and give you money. Here, uh, you know, it's it's really everything, uh, including your reputation in the community. So it's very, very hard for people to reach out and ask for help. Um, one thing is to stay as connected as possible. Um, as an older entrepreneur, I try to tell my stories. Not It's great to talk about your successes, but I've had a lot of failures. You know, people know the companies that I've, I'm associated with that have succeeded. There's a much, much, much longer list that I don't usually publicize of all the companies that, that didn't excuse me, that didn't make it. Uh, one of the things that my wife and I have done a couple times in, you know, in, out in the valley during a couple downturns and you get really stressed out, you could lose all your money, you could lose your house, all your stuff. And we went through a mental exercise once of, well, now, wait a minute, what's the worst that would actually happen? And we said, um, you know, if we lost it all, we'd probably still have enough money to get an old RV and park it at her parents' place and start over. And I thought, man, that would be awesome, <laughs> yeah. you know, to just have a clean slate, right? So it's usually never as bad as you tell yourself it is. Um, people are usually way more supportive than you think they're going to be. I mean, we have it in our minds that people are going to point their fingers and laugh, and some of them will, and those are people that you don't want to associate with anyway. So uh, there's typically a much more supportive community than you're aware of. So reach out, 
ask for help. As horrible as it sounds that you might fail someday, you might fail someday, but that's not the end of your life. Things go on, right? Yeah, and I think uh, you will fail someday. It's a matter of how significant that is, and uh, I'm not going to tell too much about my own story, but uh, I, Michigan in the Great Recession or the Great Financial Crisis, whichever one you want to refer to it, 2008 to 2011, I had a fair amount of real estate that I was involved with, and that took me down. And uh, I came out to Colorado with uh, um, not much uh, left in the, the, the basket, if you will, um, and I would just want to encourage people, there are life after um, a failure. Uh, there is life after uh, losing a lot, if not everything. And uh, you just got to pick yourself back up and, uh, and keep going. And do not um, take a step that is uh, a very permanent step. Um, find out whatever help you can find, uh, whether it's community or the mental health professional or the pastor or your friend or family members, uh, some way find out because we are in stressful times and entrepreneurship is no picnic. It's not something, uh, we see people on fast company magazine or whatever that, you know, took a thousand dollars and made it into millions. Um, that is a rare, rare, rare situation. Do not, uh, put yourself as that is uh, what uh, entrepreneurship is about. It's something far different than that. And we've been discussing about the the human aspect and the camaraderie and the the more than just being a job kind of thing that uh, is important. So, Jason, what uh, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, my heart goes out to people that have built their life and they've worked hard and they did all the right things and still things didn't work out. Um, I've, I've, uh, I relate to a lot of what you said, Phil, and that, uh, and I don't know if I can say it you know, better than some of you guys have done here today, but there's, um, there's an identity in our work and we have this assumption that uh, we have to compare ourselves to the likes of Elon Musk or Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg. And that's how we, we see the Instagram posts of our friends and social media. And so there's this um, illusion that we have to maintain in our lifestyle, in our, um, appearances. Um, and that, that can be a big part of our identity. It can be a big part of how we define ourselves with other people. I've had the fortunate, um, uh, I've been fortunate enough to be on, on TV, to be in the press, to uh, do TED Talks and do all these things. So I've, I've, I've also lost everything many times over. I've, I've come up and down. And I, I really uh, understand the emotional toll that takes on um, your psyche, on your family, on your finances, and to rebuild again. But to what you were saying, Phil, you can rebuild again. Absolutely. Thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate thank the you. honesty. And yeah. again, uh, thank you, Sage, for uh, allowing us to use your equipment and uh, to make this uh, happen. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sage. Yeah.